Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! And now, as ever, to the papers. Lots of different stories on the Sunday papers. Everyone very interested in Six Nations. Scotland playing wonderfully, I have to say, yesterday. Well done, Scotland. Uh, the Sunday Telegraph has gone pursuing, like a dog with a bone, the Iraqi witch hunt story. Remember the, the, the lawyer who was struck off this week? Then on the Mail on Sunday, they have a story about Nigel Farage and a friend of his. I'll say no more, no more about that at the moment. And some fruity emails involving David Beckham and his campaign for knighthood. The Sunday Express has the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Lord Carey, uh, defending Trump and blasting his critics. Um, and then finally, we've got the Sunday Times there. Um, they've got a big, big story on defence procurement failures, pages and pages inside about failures in our defence system. And again, rugby on the front page. So much to talk about. But we're going to start with George, George Parker, talking about the Tory revolt on Brexit. You've got a story from the Mail on Sunday, George. Yeah, that's right. The Mail on Sunday says May faces Tory revolt over cliff-edge Brexit. And, <laughs> of course, the, Theresa May got this huge majority last week in the House of Commons when the bill got oh. its second reading, but it's back in the Commons this week. There's going to be a big bust-up. Uh, I think Anna, 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 oh, I, Anna I, I, may I, I, well I be involved in this. To, uh, but the Mail on Sunday is saying, saying that basically you're going to be putting down an amendment or supporting, <laughs> supporting an amendment which basically says that Theresa May needs to come back to the Parliament for parliamentary consent if she wants to walk away yes, from the negotiating the no table. Deal. It's this end game and it's the no deal. So PM's been absolutely clear if she gets a deal she'll bring it back to the House of Commons, in fact to both chambers, uh, and there will be votes and rightly so and a debate and so on and so forth. But if there's no deal then the government will determine what happens next and I think it should come into Parliament. I don't know why people are so fearful of that. Um, so this would give Parliament, right at the end of the process, the chance to say, do you know what, we don't like this deal. Mm -hmm. I guess the danger for the Prime Minister is that if Parliament rejects the deal, if, she has lost all her authority, it's very late to go back and but, plead for a better one. If I may say, that's if we get a deal, and the PM's been clear, she will do those things. Yeah. This is about if there's no deal. And our fear is that if there is no deal before the two years is up, and look, let's be honest about this, you know, we're not really going to start these negotiations until the conclusion of the French elections and then the German elections. Right. And so this won't, in 18 months, she's got to get a bespoke deal on trade, customs, security and EU citizens. We think that will be very difficult. And in the event of no deal, Right. We want Parliament to decide what happens next. You see, a lot of people will suspect that this is an attempt to stay inside the EU by the back door. This is, these are these mad conspiracy theories <laughs> that people really have to get real. Last week, overwhelmingly, members of Parliament, like me, voted for us to leave the European Union. That is the reality. I've never said anything otherwise. I always said, like all Conservatives, I would honour the result. And that's what we are doing. And we're the only party that is united on that. Mm. Suzanne Evans, mm. UKIP is very suspicious about this process, aren't you? Well, I, I think, Anna, first of all, well done for voting with the government last week. I'm very glad. I hope you keep up that good work. You know, the people have voted to leave. And I'm with Theresa May on this. A no-deal situation where we revert to WTO trading rules is going to be far better than a bad deal that's going to be coming from Brussels. Oh. And you talk, you know, and, and, and again, the, the mail uses the phrase, going over this cliff edge. There are so many countries out there who are not in the single market, who don't even have a trade deal with the European Union, but I don't see them thrashing around at the bottom of the cliff, uh, you know, gasping for breath to save their lives. Many of them are actually doing incredibly so no, well. Really think you no need to deal talk to is British not. Business. In, I, I do they talk to British business, and what I'm really pleased about Anna is, as I'm seeing actually, British business is increasingly becoming much more positive. Even the CBI, you know, straightforward re uh, re uh, Remainers, absolutely pushed for the Remain agenda, and now actually coming around to this idea okay. that Britain has a brighter future outside yeah, the European Union. That's different from cliff edge, and I don't think you'll find there the CBI not going wants to be. A cliff edge. Let, let, me move away, no let me move away briefly from the White Cliffs to uh, the other part of this whole thing, of course, was about immigration and the promise that we'd have control mm. over immigration and the, the clear implication would be that it would come down a lot. Mm. And Suzanne, you've got a story from the, yesterday's Guardian, Stephen yeah, Crabb, former some, cabinet some minister. Some cross-party consensus mm. on this. Uh, Stephen Crabb, the Tory MP, is urging Theresa May to guarantee the status of EU nationals already resident in Britain. And I'm absolutely in agreement with that and, and so is you kept nobody at any point during the leave campaign suggested that eu nationals would have uh, been in any way affected by brexit um 
they must have the right to stay here. EU nationals came here in good faith, uh, expecting to be able to stay, and that's the way it should stay. And as well, UKIP's so NHS champion, I'm particularly concerned about EU workers in the National Health Service absolutely. because they are very important. And yet already we're seeing some, some fear there. And indeed, there are fewer nurses coming to Britain now since the referendum vote. We have to get this sorted now. Theresa May should take the moral high ground and say, yes, you can stay. I think she has actually said that. It's just that well, she has. The, there's, there's, there's no to suggestion hold, that there will be deportations bit, or anything yeah, like that no. going on. But can I ask you? I mean, the other thing that Stephen Crabb says <laughs> is this promise that we're going to get rid of immigration is going to come way down is for the birds. Yep. That our economy is dependent upon immigration and it's going to carry on whether we're inside the EU or outside the EU, George. Yes, I mean, one of the things Stephen Crabb says in this article is that students shouldn't be included in the migration He's figures. Right. Kind of and I was, I was at yes. a, a seminar yesterday attended by hundreds of Chinese students who are studying in British universities, some really bright kids, who are having, having to go home the moment they finish yep. their degrees. I mean, these people would be brilliant for the British economy, but because they're included in the migration figures, right. they're sent home. So we need to be right. really honest, and we need to have a proper debate, and it'll always be interesting to see at the end when we leave the EU, Suzanne, whether or not we have fewer more or the same number no, of immigrants. The only way you have less question. is by trashing our economy, which undoubtedly, Meanwhile, unfortunately, makes Meanwhile, he said, <laughs> bringing us further on, ah. uh, this is a, a, an issue which has divided the Labour Party as Look, well. I mean, a... I think my party actually is pretty much, we are together, there's only Ken that voted against, of course, last week, and, and for understandable reasons, but my goodness me, what a mess the <laughs> Labour Party is in. We have this... She said happily. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm actually not, no? because we, no, we need a good, the strong opposition. opposition. Yeah. It's good for democracy, but I mean, it is farcical what is happening. So Diane, who was taken terribly poorly uh, and actually couldn't vote, even though there were people with very serious cancers who did come in and vote, um, we see that they are all over the place. Um, and we should be in no doubt whatsoever about these huge fractions within Labour. There, are, there um, are about a dozen Labour MPs who defied Jeremy Corbyn last week who are waiting to find out whether they're going to be sacked. Uh, including um, Clive Lewis, yeah. who's one of his main lieutenants. Now, you could end up in a situation where he's scrabbling around to try and find someone to sit in the shadow cabinet. Clive he Lewis matters in particular because so many Labour MPs see him as a future leader. They do, and people say that he may quit as a prelude to some future leadership. But that, to be frank, they are that, a that's terrible some way mess. Up. We're, we're having a sweepstake in office about how you might put in the shadow cabinet. Maybe El Gato, the, uh, the cat, could yes, be... Yes, uh, it could end up... Can, like can, can we just be clear that in, in the week ahead, what's going to happen is a whole series of amendments about EU citizens that Suzanne was talking about, but also the vote at the end of the process that we talked about at the beginning, and many more will be put down, and then we will see whether this piece of legislation is the same as it came into the Commons with, or very, very different. I, th mm. I think one of the things people have to remember is, is that the, the bill is, is what I call a vehicle to deliver the result of the referendum. It's not about the contents of it. So we'll have to see which amendments actually fall are, within are, scope. Are accepted. Uh, yeah. And there could be very few, actually. Mm. OK, now um, let's move on to Trump. Um, George, you had a story from The Observer at some point there about yes. there's lots and lots of trumpery all over the papers today. Yeah, I mean, the papers are sort of picking apart the sort of dramatic last few weeks. And we just heard this suggestion that his appeal against this judge in Washington state who wanted to stop the ban on migrants has failed. I don't know what stage it's at, but it looks like this is a really, really big confrontation that he, at the moment he seems to be losing. Between the, the president and the so-called judges, as he refers to them. And it's a, an incredible thing. And in fact, you know, the, the judges are seen by Trump as part of this liberal conspiracy, which is reflected here by Harry Kunzru in, in The Observer, who's talking about the, the pain he feels and the fact he's checking Twitter in the middle of the night to see what might have happened, what the president might have tweeted out. And on the other side of the coin, and it's a double page spread in the Observer, you've got John Daniel Davidson, who's saying, look, Trump is doing exactly what he said he was going to do. He's not a fascist. And there are people on the coast, the East Coast and the West Coast, the media elite, who just don't get it. As Kerry was saying, they should calm down about it all. Nonetheless, this is a huge issue for the British establishment because he's going to be coming here almost certainly in the summer for a big state visit. How is he received and so on? Nigel Farage is about the only big figure in British politics who has been a resolute supporter of Trump all the way through, Suzanne, but he's on the front page for other reasons as well. Um, and you've got some trouble with your man in the Stoke by-election. Can we explain this? Because Paul Nuttall, your new leader, mm. has got a nice house in Stoke with no furniture, um, a mattress on the floor, and it seems a very bizarre story, but it's quite a serious one, isn't it? Well, I'm, I'm not sure it is. I think uh, the Labour and uh, perhaps Channel 4 have been medal-making here a little bit. Um, the tenancy, as I understand it, the tenancy agreement on this house was signed some weeks ago. Uh, but as we all know, when we're uh, renting a new house, it can take some time to fully move in. But as far as I'm aware, uh, there was furniture 
in the house. I think Michael Crick looked through the letterbox, but of course, mm. what's in our hallways is not necessarily indicative of so what's in the rest of the there, house. Is he? Yes, he is. Yes, oh, really? absolutely. How long has he been living there? Um, I think he moved in um, whatever uh, last week. When he one got day. selected, I'm not sure. Mm. Well, well, he's mm. never made, he's never made he's never pretended to be local, born and bred. So that's so why, why I think he some why has he got his house there? Well, why not? Because he's on the campaign trail every day. Of course, he's going to be I, there. I was going to ask George why is this an important story, or is this an important story? Well, it's an, yeah, I mean, it's an important story in the sense that if he's masquerading to be something that he isn't, no, uh, and if he's, he's broken any that's, electoral not, rules, but the police and that's are involved at this point, aren't they? I think. Uh, oh, but anyone can report something to the police, okay. as you know. I don't think so. It doesn't necessarily mean there's anything in it. You've also picked the front page of the express with yeah. lord carey yeah now, he writes in express I, quite a lot i think this is quite interesting because of course uh, the former archbishop of canterbury lord carey it, it was one of the more conservative with a small c uh, evangelical archbishops that we we have and he's uh, saying today that there's been this hysteria over president trump and I, I kind of agree with him talking about the demonstrations that we've had he says i can't recall such demonstrations against terrible autocratic regimes such as burma sudan and north korea uh, it seems to be one of the key characteristics of those who consider themselves progressive to reserve of condemnation for America, yeah. the West or Israel and ignore much greater evil, evil doers. He, he says, you know, when it comes to the world's worst politician, there are several other candidates who can this, trump Trump. This, Suzanne, might be because we hold the, hold the Americans to higher mm. standards. We expect mm. more of them <clears throat> and therefore it's more of a yeah. shock when we see this kind of well, I think, I think that's right. But, uh, you know, and, and people want to criticise Trump. Absolutely. I've got no problem with that. But all this talk about preventing him coming to the country, he's not allowed to, to, to meet MPs in Westminster Hall. I think really, if you've got problems with somebody, the last thing you want to do is somebody who is showing a view that is perhaps less internationalist than you might like it to be. The last thing you do is match their standards. So I think we should be welcoming him and making, making our values clear. He doesn't, he doesn't meet MPs in Westminster Hall. He was, it's, it's it was, a very I think, special... I think Obama speak there. Or, no, no, they, it's a very mm. special occasion, yes. which is reserved for people who have done great achieve, have had great achievements in their leadership. So they so address Westminster Hall. too early in the leadership for him to be He can go somewhere else within Parliament. I think it's mm. the Royal Gallery, which is the alternative. Westminster Hall is, in my opinion, should be for the great there leaders. There is talk about a boycott, and he's not isn't a great there? Would you, would you he's go, only been in. To, would you go watch him? <laughs> I, I'm not sure I would. I think the, the one thing about Trump is what does he want and crave most? And that's attention. He's like a little spoilt child. And I think there's much to be said about actually just not giving him all of this stuff because he mm. just loves it. Mm -hmm. And he's the sort where really just ignoring often could be the best thing. Yeah, what we shouldn't ignore um... is what he does. Yeah. And what he's done with this executive order, this executive ban, is, is, is outrageous and it's hugely offensive and it has no basis, in fact, in any event. Well, except it's carrying on from Obama's George. previous policy as no. well. In that it was, I, think, I understand it was Obama who I first identified these countries. He didn't ban we, because they, we, you know, we but they weren't We need to move on to one other story at least, which is the, the transport story, actually. Oh, yes, indeed. Um, which is the Sunday Times has done it. This, the Transport Select Committee mm. um, produced this report overnight, too late for most of the papers. Yeah. But it basically says that the Department of Transport is not fit for purpose in, in handling the franchises that then control the British railway system. Yeah. Can you explain any more about this? Because it's quite a technical issue, isn't it? Well, it's a technical issue. I mean, and it's messed up, mixed up with the Southern Rail dispute, which has brought privatisation into disrepute. And the argument of the Select Committee is that the Department of Transport simply can't cope with the complexity of negotiating these really difficult contracts with a whole host of private sector companies. Um, and Chris Grady, I'm sure, will be defending the system mm. in the future. But one thing I would say, I think there's sort of a false nostalgia around how brilliant the railways were yes. in the era before privatisation. And the one thing that um, these nostalgias often overlook is the fact that since privatisation, rail passenger numbers have actually doubled. Well, we've got a lot more to talk about this. We've run out of time here, I'm sorry, but thank you very much, all of you. The Sunday Times leads with an investigation into Britain's armed forces, highlighting what it calls gaping holes and concerns Britain couldn't defend itself against a serious military attack. The government's plans to deliver more affordable and secure rental deals is the top story in The Observer. The Telegraph says a parliamentary inquiry will conclude that a government investigation into historic allegations of abuse in Iraq is unfit for purpose. The former Archbishop of Canterbury, George Carey, has called for the world to give Donald Trump a chance, reports the Sunday Express. The Mail on Sunday has a story about Nigel Farage. It says he is now sharing a £4 million house with the head of a Eurosceptic think tank. Zoe Ball is pictured on the front of the mirror, which features a story about her love's life. And Colleen Nolan, the celebrity Big Brother winner, has credited the show with helping to save her marriage. That's according to the Daily Star Sunday. Well, 
Joining me to talk about all of these uh, and more is uh, BuzzFeed's Hannah Jewell, the former Conservative MP of Esther McVeigh and the former Chief Executive of Vote Leave, now a senior fellow at the Legatum Institute, Matthew Elliott. Good to see you all. Thanks for being here. So let's kick off, shall we? Um, what are we looking at first? The Observer. The Tories break with Thatcher's homes policies to back renters. Is this welcome news or is it a disappointment? I think it's good news. I think it shows that um, you know, Brexit's not the only story in town. The government needs to focus on other things as well. And the housing white paper this week will be very important. And what the government said it will do is to build a million new homes by 2020. So it needs to increase the supply of houses, it needs to think about new methods of construction, these modular homes that are coming along, and also think about how to help rented, the rented sector too. And of course it is really difficult um, to, for people to get on the ladder or for even to, to rent. I mean, I was out in Croydon um, talking to Gavin Barwell, the housing minister, we'll be hearing what he's got to say le le later. And some of the stories that people are talking about, how much they pay in rent for really substandard accommodation is quite shocking, actually. I think especially for young people, it's basically impossible to get on that housing ladder unless you have a grandparent with a house about to die, basically, <laughs> as grim as that is. And it's actually the cost of a house in London. The average cost for a home has gone from, I think, about $80,000, or pounds rather, American, uh, to about half a million. But it, it shows how complex the issue is. Of course you need more housing, but it's never that easy to get planning permission. People don't necessarily want it in their, in their backgrounds, uh, in their areas. So what else are we going to do? So the only other I think the people who is... don't want it in their area already have houses <laughs> is the problem. Yes, but you've got to go through a democratic process. People don't want it, and then you're looking at a population increase of a third of a million every year, so a new city is coming in. What is the other option there? You have to look at the rental prices. Double the number of people from 2000 are now living in rented homes. So of course, so this is going to be part of a series of options and part of a whole raft of... Uh, of uh, uh, new policies that's going to have to come through to help those people who need to live and we all need to live in a home. And of course the government's talked before about trying to solve the housing crisis so I think we'll have to wait and see whether it's going to be any different yes. uh, this time. Um, let's talk about the next uh, story. This is Diane Abbott, isn't it, we've got, who missed a rather important vote this week on Article 50. She says she was ill with a migraine. Should we give her the benefit of the doubt? Well, page eight in The Times is uh, the story, and for me, it might be tucked away there, and you're quite right, there will be now a new phrase. It won't be throwing a sickie, it'll be throwing a, a, a migraine or doing a Diane. <laughs> um, but it really is a serious story, and I think this could be the sort of a momentous moment about the future for Corbyn. So here he has a closest ally who doesn't actually vote. So you either look at it as favouritism, or you can look at it as being something far more sinister. Is this the start of the removal of Corbyn? How does Labour get a new leader and what is the path they've got to take? And if they are going to remove Corbyn, they say they'd need to have a deal with the left wing of the party to at least have a left winger on the potential candidates to go forward. And the only way they could do that is by having maybe a Brutus moment to remove them, a closest ally. So is it favouritism or is it far more sinister than that? Is this the start of the removal of Corbyn? Maybe taking a leaf out of the Conservatives book there, you're much better at having these Brutus well, we moments. Do, we, <laughs> we wouldn't need to do that. Do you think we Labour is ready for another Brutus moment just after a previous Brutus moment that completely failed? If, if they think they've got two big by-elections coming forward, it looks like they could lose both of them. Mm. It looks already, and we're looking to the elections going forward, it isn't working. On the back of the vote last week, they've lost 7,000 grass sort of uh, members, uh, uh, members on the ground because they don't agree with what he's done. You've actually just the, split the party. And the other point about this, of course, is that the Eurosceptic split story used to be a Tory story in the 1990s and 2000s. Now it's really a Labour Party story, isn't it? Mm. The Labour Party's completely split on this. Mm. And how will any leader reconcile the fact that Labour seats include some of the most Remain supporting seats and some of the most Eurosceptic seats in the country? It's incredible Labour's ability to draw attention to itself when everyone could be talking about under a stronger united opposition, Theresa May literally handing hold, mm. holding hands with Donald Trump and it seems to pick moments like right after the Brexit vote to collapse before our eyes. Mm. Let's talk about Donald Trump. You've got a story from BuzzFeed, haven't you, the uh, website, about supporters of Donald Trump trying to influence the French presidential election on behalf of Marine Le Pen. What, what's going on here? Um, so a few of our reporters in our French office and in our London office um, managed to uh, join up to some 
far right anonymous online chat communities um, and on a messaging platform called Discord and um, discovered the ways in which the French far right and the American far right or supporters of, of Donald Trump and sort of his little army of trolls um, are working together and managed to do, managing to actually have quite a bit of influence over French social media trends. Um, there are about 400 people um, our reporters have identified who are able to get such a mass of tweets going that they managed recently to get a um, hashtag trending in France nationally um, that was about help our homeless and it being a campaign saying why are we letting in immigrants basically when, when we have homeless people and um, there are actually French people online in these forums and they think it seems to be um, with some participation from actually a National Front politician uh, giving French language phrases to American internet trolls who would like to help them get these things. Matthew, Alec, you of course got much experience uh, in running campaigns with Vote Leave. I'm quite interested to know your take on the French presidential election. Do you think Marine Le Pen can actually win? I think that would be a, a bit of a stretch. I think she'll get through to the second round of the election, the runoff round. But I think, I think she find it difficult to get a majority to actually win this. But what this short story shows is the fact that with um, the growth of online campaigning, politics is now global. So you have US people in this context trying to influence the French elections, but also in the US presidential election you had Russian trolls influencing uh, the election there. But can we say this is nothing new? Because mm. people for a long time would have been supporting, so you would have had the Democrats in England or you would have had the Republicans abroad. They're just doing it in a different way and every party will have its way to muster up control. Everybody's been doing online campaigns, whether it's sort of in the UK, whether it's out or whether it's global. So it isn't really anything new, except I guess it's come at a moment where we're all looking at uh, conspiracy theories. Have Russians affected <laughs> the American it's sort of so conspiracy theory to say that the, these sort of online trolls are working together and actually what makes but it different have. than past than that then then in the past this collaboration is that this is um, a collaboration from people to people as but opposed to government to government. it's cheaper than ever, isn't it? That's and, and that's where it's going. And as we go into extreme communication, extreme yeah. technology, mm. this is what we'll be doing because we are a global community. And many so journalists at proper outlets um, actually rely a lot on these trending hashtags. So proper yeah. outlets. don't believe that's what you see on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, page two of The Sun. Uh, let's talk about that now. The Brexit nobility. Love it. Um, Brexit bashing peers are plotting to derail Theresa May's timetable for quitting the EU. There'd be a revolt, wouldn't there, if the House of Lords tried to derail Brexit? I think there would be. Of course, this week we saw the House of Commons vote for the Article 50 bill, and it will soon go to the House of Lords. And what uh, The Sun's saying, and also a very good piece from Norman Lamont in the comment section, he's saying that if they try and block um, this bill, then actually Theresa May should either call an early election or actually even abolish the House of Lords. And I think because there's so many cronies now in the House of Lords, put in there by David Cameron and Tony Blair, there's no love for the House of Lords now. So if they go against the will of the people, that'll be a big mistake for them. But equally, they've got to adhere to the Salisbury sort of convention. That is mm. their convention in the Lords, that if it was something in the previous manifesto, which it was, there'd be a referendum and you'd agree with the vote of the people, that you could not mm. vote against that. So they have their own convention, which they should adhere to. So not only they're not an elected chamber, um, so they're, 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 they can't have a greater say than the democratic voice, but they do have conventions to which they've got to work to. So I think they need to look at that. And self-preservation is a huge thing. They'll mm. be thinking about their own futures. And of course, they'll make noise, which is right. Of course, they will scrutinise what's going on, which is right. But at the end of the day, this was in the manifesto and the people have spoken. Do you think Theresa May would be willing to call an election in order to get a popular mandate when she is speaking as the Brexit vote as her popular mandate? despite being a Remainer. I think if she feels that basically the House of Lords is going against her and she feels that she needs to have the backing of the people in a general election, I could see that happening, yes. Would she risk, would that not risk derailing um, the unstoppable progress of Brexit negotiations and triggering Article 50? If she feels she needs an election to get this bill through the House of Commons, through the Parliament, sorry, I think she'll call one. But I, I, I think common sense will prevail for the reasons we've right. just said in the House of Lords, and I don't think that she'll need to go that far. Well, right. have to uh, yeah, see, we'll see. see what happens. The but we don't have a crystal ball. <laughs> Another election, <laughs> everybody. <laughs> Hooray. <laughs> yeah, I hope we're ready. Hannah Jewell, S. McVeigh, Matthew Elliott, thank you very much for your thoughts.